to start that. Right down, so we, down there. Oh, nice.
beneficiary store uh, that special offering. We invite your participation in it. This is Epiphany Sunday. That's a, one of those great words of the church. Does anybody have any idea what that means? Ah, yes. <laughs> the wise men showed up. You know, we put them all together in our in our uh, manger tableaus for Christmas. But in reality, the wise men did not were not there at Jesus' birth. Not that night, and not for several months actually. Uh, they showed up later. But we kind of put it all together. But in the church calendar, it has its own special day. Which is why the Advent wreath is still up, but only the Christ candle is lit in the center. We leave it up through Epiphany Sunday, and then all the stuff is supposed to come down as we get on with the rest of the church here. So uh, that's why it's here, and, and we're going to be singing about that uh, and featuring that during our worship service today. So our opening hymn is number 288. And then no, and if you're able, we invite you to stand wherever you are, whether you're up here or downstairs, and uh, we'll sing We Three Kings.
like to take a few moments this morning to be able to offer to the Lord and join in prayer together and sharing our joys and concerns. So I don't know, I'd like you to, if you have a jar or two you'd like to share with us today, to go to the microphone in the back and uh, so we can all have a chance to hear what's on your minds today. Um, to begin with, we'd like to invite the congregation to be in prayer um, for the Fiscus family. Uh, Dave's mom passed away this past week. Her, her funeral is going to be on Tuesday down in Marshalltown. Uh, and Gerda will be here at the Conrad Cemetery. So uh, you can read about that. I think I'm actually going to read the funeral all the Anderson has the funeral. Uh, Anderson funeral has the services. So you can read more about it on their website. She was diagnosed with breast cancer. 
So I just gonna have to, she was supposed to start cleaning off right before Christmas. So prayers for both of them. Thank you. It's joy that Iowa State won their ball game yesterday. Yes! <laughs> stepped into a new year, we once again look forward with optimism to what is in store for us. We pray for an end of the pandemic this year and a return to fellowship and the joy of, of living each day, not only in your presence, but in the presence of one another. Mount Sinai 
His voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed, so that only unshakable things will remain. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping Him with holy fear and awe. For our God is a devouring fire. Now let's ask the Spirit to take these ancient words and speak the truth of them into our lives for living faithfully in these days. Okay. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for some clarity in our minds, some conviction in our hearts, and the ability to live faithfully in Christ and for Christ. We pray that these next few minutes might encourage us to that. As we pray in Christ's name. There are certain voices in our society today who wonder, sometimes out loud, sometimes quietly, about why we're going through all the difficulties we are going through currently. Why a pandemic? Why wars and rumors of wars? I've heard it almost at least once a week since March. Are we at the end of time? Is Christ coming again soon? What's happening? I've also heard, you think God's punishing us because we've basically ignored him as a society? Why is all of this happening? That's the real question that underlines all these other questions. Why are we going through this? I wish I had an answer for you. Except the reality is, we can't see that far in the future to know. I can't tell you one practical reason why all of this is happening, though. And that is based on what's happened over the last couple thousand years in church history. That there, there come certain times and seasons in the life of the body of Christ where a reorienting of priorities takes place. When we run into a difficult patch of time or circumstance, what often happens is a reordering or a resetting of priorities. We, we sift through everything that we're going through and say, do I really need to be doing that? What is really important that I hang on to? And how do I live into the, that sort of priorities? And the church is in the middle of going through one of those periods currently. Both this congregation and the, the greater church of all. For you see, I don't believe God is punishing us. But I do believe that God wants us to rethink our priorities, to keep the main thing the main thing, and let a lot of the extraneous stuff go so that we might be available be used by God to further the building of Christ's kingdom on the earth. So, in one sense, it's a bit reassuring, because the main thing is still the main thing. What is that? 
Now, I'm not going to ask that as a rhetorical question. What is the main thing? What is the main reason the church exists today?
Presbyterians are supporting Catholic mission overseas? Unheard of! I recall one of those fundamental conversations I had years ago when we first started our local growing project for FRB then. And you know, some of you have been around long enough to remember Tim Button Harrison, one of the co-pastors over at Ibestin. And we had our first harvest celebration, and Tim walked up to me once uh, on one of that, that harvest day and looked at me and said, you know, why haven't we done this before? We both had a common interest in helping folks find food for themselves. But our denominations typically didn't work together on those kinds of projects. We were what we have grown to call being siloed, where we stay in our own little family group and, and we do our thing and don't pay a whole lot of attention to what else is going on outside our silo. And one of the great things about growing home locally is that the, the walls of the silo have been blown out. We're all in it together. And it doesn't matter who gets the credit for it anymore. We can just support and share and celebrate together. And that's a wonderful thing. But that's an example of how our priorities and our mission are being redefined and refined. We look at it differently today than we did not too many years ago. We're in one of those periods of time. So while the message of the gospel is the same, Sometimes, the vehicle and the way in which we deliver that message are different and are unique to each time and place. Now, understand that that sometimes makes us uncomfortable. that word change that we don't like. We can get awfully set in our ways. I finally got used to it going this way and now it's going differently than it did before and I have no idea how that works. Frankly, it's one of the great challenges that we as clergy have working in the church today. Because the church is radically different than the one I was trained to pastor several decades ago. Doesn't look a thing like it. Oh, there are elements that look very similar. And there are traditions that we hang on to that, that are familiar. But the world has changed around us. The church has changed Yes. And how do we function? We're left with a lot more questions than the traditional answers to those questions. What I do know is that it's not accidental that you and I are placed by God in this time and place, this particular time and place for a purpose. And that God has everything we need to function as a faithful witness for Jesus Christ today. We just have to remember that it may not look quite like it did 30, 40 years ago. Ow. Jeff standing up in the back. I, I was recalling the other day, Jeff, when I first came to Conrad 23 years ago, and the audio system for this church was in a tiny little cabinet over in the back corner back there with one switch that turned everything on. And we heard the ocean in the background most of the time. We thought 
that you know, annoying buzz that we finally got rid of the other day was bad. Well, that was nothing compared to the background hiss we often had before. The one microphone we had was turned on. Huh. Well, that's, that's what finally kicked this over the edge, wasn't it, sir? One time, a, a truck going down Center Street, a CB radio came over our, our audio system with language that was not terribly appropriate for worship. <laughs> Which was followed by a lovely sermon by the United Methodist pastor up the street two blocks whose wireless microphone came over our audio system. And the church books came out right after church that day. It was the most amazing thing. <laughs> Things have changed. And you remember when we put the temporary projector and screen up here in the sanctuary? Oh my heavens! The world was coming to an end. <laughs> Video in church. <laughs> That's all within just the time I've been here. The church doesn't. We have televisions and screens. It's different. The message is the same, but the vehicle may change. How we do things may change, but what we do is the same. <laughs> What's underneath all of this, which is the third point of this morning's message? For you see, you and I are still called to mission as the church. The real question is, what is our mission field? And that's a question that we ask collectively of ourselves as a congregation. It's a question that this congregation will answer in the next few months, as it does its congregational survey in preparation for new pastoral leadership later this year. You're going to get asked that question. What is our mission? What are we needing to get done? And what kind of leader do we need to make that happen? Or to at least resource and enable that to happen? But it's no accident or coincidence that we are here in this time and place for the mission that God has for us as a congregation to do. Now, what the writer of Hebrews says and warns us about is to be able to be open to hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit speak. Just like the prophets of old, the human prophets of old, the Spirit now delivers that message. And how often are we open to hearing the voice of the Spirit speak? That's not just a, a question for us as individuals, but it's a question for us collectively as a congregation. And what it really boils down to is, it's not so much about all the good things that I want to do for God, or what we want to do for God, or that we ought to do for God. The real question is, what does God want to do in and through us? It's flipping the whole model around and looking at it from God's perspective rather than ours. And that's going to be the great challenge for us this year as a congregation. How do we see ourselves, not from our point of view, but from God's point of view? In other words, how can we live as a community of faith, a fellowship, <clears throat> especially once the pandemic's done? And we're able to gather together in fellowship. What should that look like? What have we been taking for granted that has been taken away from us for the last 10 months? What do we bring back? How do we do that? How important is that that we gather together to love and support each other? That was the question. How do we deliver the good news that we are the stewards of? Or as I have been sharing with my confirmation class, the, the next link in the chain of 2,000 years of links that have been formed, passing on the message we've received. Or as one of my seminaries professors said, that's your primary task. 
preachers. They take the gospel message you've been given and pass it on to the next couple of generations without tinkering with it too much. And I always like that. The way in which I deliver that message might change radically. I mean, I mean, online. That was unheard of 30 years ago. Yeah. I had barely got introduced to a computer 30 years ago. Now look. So you see, the vehicle changes all the time. The way in which we communicate changes all the time. But the message that we are tasked to communicate is exactly the same as it has been for 2,000 years because it's still relevant. You and I need to see ourselves as agents not of our own agenda, but agents of God's agenda. What does God want to say to the world through how we live out our lives as Christians? And that becomes the defining question that we need to answer. Because that informs our mission and our ministry together to one another and to the community. So, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be an adventure as we seek to answer some of those questions in the next few months. This is the first of a series of messages that we're, I'm calling, What's Next? And we're going to explore some of those questions as we, we go along here in January. I hope that we'll give you pause to stop and think a little bit and to have some conversation amongst yourselves about it. What's God want us to do? What's that going to look like? How do we move forward? Let's pray. Oh, oh, In some ways, Lord, these are not easy questions because we can't always see how they look when we try to answer them. We've watched your hand at work among us as it comes to bricks and mortar and, and, and working on our facility and understanding that is an important part of our witness in the community, that we are vibrant and alive. And Lord, we appreciate the fact that we have this wonderful facility that can be used by us and by the community and bears witness to our faith in Jesus Christ. But we are more than just this building as a congregation. So help us to be open to your Spirit's voice as you help us to understand what's next and how we can move forward as your people called in this time and place to bear witness to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and the love that you have shown us that we get to pass on to others. Hold us close to you and to one another we pray. So we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Prepare for sharing this sacrament of the Lord's Supper this morning. We're going to invite you, if you're able, to stand, and we're going to sing hymn number 290, another one of our epiphany hymns, as with gladness, men of old.
friends we gather around this table with a reminder that Christ is the host of this meal. And so you don't have to necessarily be a member of this congregation or the Presbyterian Church USA in order to share in this meal. The only requirement that you have to participate is to trust Jesus Christ as your, to be your Savior and Lord. Because He's the one that's the host, the one that does the inviting. And you are invited at this table if you are in a relationship with Him. We'd also invite any of our baptized children who are learning the meaning of what it is to be a part of the body of Christ, to share in that vision of ministry and mission that we've been talking about this morning. You two are welcome at this table because we don't earn our place here. It's already reserved for you. And it is an enabling process that as we share in this meal, I believe the Spirit empowers and equips us to be the faithful witness for Jesus Christ. So you are welcome at this table also. Friends, this falls in a long tradition, a 2,000 year tradition, of how the church has celebrated in this way. It's recorded for us in the Corinthian letters of the church, the, the, the words of institution that we use. Uh, those are their scriptural words. Uh, they're also traditional words in the Latin of the church. And so we, we take this admonition seriously that, that as Christ has invited us to remember him in this way, we do so not as an act of duty or obligation, but out of joy in experiencing the living presence of the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit as we gather together around this meal. Uh, I invite us to take a few moments to pray as we give thanks for God's provision for us today. Let's pray. God of grace, thank you. Thank you that you have so thoughtfully provided a tangible way that we as humans can begin to see the divine at work. <clears throat> we are reminded through the bread and the cup that you have given your very best in order that we might not only have life, but have abundant life. And that as we share in this meal, we are reminded that we are to share our lives with one another and our life together as the church with the people around us. For Lord, you have helped us understand that the, what we're doing today is not a, a private meal. Just for us. But we, we share this publicly and in fellowship with one another and with you. In order that we might demonstrate that the Holy Spirit is bringing us together and binding us together as the body of Christ. Just as you have called your people together and bound them not only to one another, but to you in every time and place. So open our hearts, we pray, that we might remove ourselves from the center and place you there. And that we might see our life together as the church from your point of view, not just ours. We pray, Lord, that in the sharing of this meal, we might be empowered to be your faithful witnesses in this time and place. As we would offer to you this prayer in the name of Christ. night in the upper room after Jesus and the disciples had observed the Passover meal, the night before he was to be 
arrested, tried, and crucified. Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed it, and he broke it and said, Take and eat. For this is a symbol of my body, which is being broken for you. And each time you eat, remember me. And then after they eat, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup represents the new covenant or agreement that is made possible as my blood is being poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And each time you drink, remember me. For as often as you eat and drink, you are remembering my death until I come again. And when we remember the death of Christ, we're led to remember the resurrection of Christ. And the hope that we have that not only lives within us, but that we are so privileged to be able to share with the world around us. As has become our custom in the last few months, the elements for you to receive this meal are downstairs in, in the entryway. There are prepackaged ones if you want to take them home or to someone you know, and you can share the community meal with them. There are what we might call live elements um, that are downstairs. There's bread and, and individual cups, and you're welcome to take your communion before you go today downstairs in the entryway. So we uh, are appreciative of many ways in which we can take this meal and pass it on and share it with our neighbors and friends and family and as we share together today. I think we're ready for our final hymn, which is one of my favorite ones this time of year. So again, if you're able, please stand as we share um, David's lead life from number two to number two.
And that's the vision that we have. That we wait with eager anticipation for Christ calling us home to that wonderful eternity that is waiting for us. The fulfillment of all the hopes and dreams that we have of life with our Lord and Savior for eternity. Friends, that's the good news that we have been given the task to share. And as you faithfully go from this place to bear witness to our Lord in Christ, go with God's love and Christ's peace and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit step away. Amen. Go